Hey, there's Erica Leek. Hi, Erica. I think we can go ahead and get started. Um, thank you everyone for joining us today for the Go Valley Johnson Terrace Neighborhood Plan Panel discussion. Um, so my name is Alexia. I'm an organizer with Poder and I'm gonna be moderating the discussion today. Um, Poder is celebrating its 30th year of dignity and struggle um, with a series of panel discussion regarding the various struggles that Poder has gone through. Um, on, in May, we did a panel discussion on the toxic tank farm and how Poder and activists were able to relocate it to prevent further harm from the community. And then in June, we had a panel on the BFI, um, which was bringing households, um, over 350,000 households recyclables, but it was also creating a mini landfill and harming the health and community of those living around. And then we also had a discussion on the Holly Power Plant and on the Young Scholars for Justice. And if you go to the Poder website, you can look at all our past events. Um, they're all public on our YouTube. And today we're gonna be discussing, as I said, Go Valley Johnson Terrace. Um, with our panelists today, we have Susana Almanza, Silvia Herrera, Dani Arianes, and Janie Rangel, um, who were both, um, who were all involved. Mm -hmm. Um, so first, I'm going to start with a land acknowledgement. Um, we well, that would like to acknowledge that we are meeting on the indigenous lands of Turtle Island, the ancestral name for what is now called North America. We would like to specifically acknowledge the Alabama Cuseta, the Caddo, the Carrizo, the Coatecan, the Comanche, Kekapu, Lipanapache, Tonkawa, and Isleta del Sur Pueblo and all the American Indian and indigenous peoples and communities who have been or become a part of these lands and territories in Texas. Oh. And we're gonna kick off this panel with a presentation. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen and Susana is gonna start and explain um, what the Go Valley Johnson Terrace neighborhood plan is and why it's important. Yes, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for joining us in this historic moment as we look back on our historic victory in rezoning over 600 properties uh, in East Austin in the city of Austin. First, let's uh, talk about what is zoning. So zoning outlines the types of development and operational uses of land that is allowed on a given track. For example, the zoning classifications include industrial, commercial, agricultural, single family, multifamily, rural residential, public use, recreation, and open space. And if you look at this map to your left and you see that purple, that is a zoning designation that signifies industrial. And if you look at the yellow on the map, that is a zoning that, dig that signifies uh, residential, uh, single family homes and so forth. Uh, red signifies uh, the commercial and green is the open space so that you can get a better understanding of what uh, zoning and, and uh, how uh, land tracks are developed. Next slide. So zoning and land use planning have been described by some scholars as not only as a root enabling cause of disproportionate burdens and environmental injustice, but also the most fundamental and potentially most powerful and legal weapons deployed in the cause of racism. The history of land use planning and zoning in Austin helps to explain how the unequal distribution of environmental burdens has occurred and why these historic patterns have been the source of many environmental justice problems that confront people of color and low-income communities in East Austin. Zoning and land use planning have been used to segregate people of color to East Austin. While city leaders are creating reports and task force to address housing, affordability, displacement, and gentrification, they continue with the zoning policies that continue to displace and gentrify East Austin neighborhoods. 
And before I go to the next slide, we're gonna ask everybody to mute themselves uh, because we're getting feedback. So please unmute yourself. Next slide. The Go Valley Johnson Terrace neighborhood planning area is located in East Austin and its boundaries are Pleasant Valley and Weberville Road to the west, Oak Springs Airport and Northwestern Railroad to the north, and US 183 to the east, and Colorado River to the south. Next slide. The Go Valley Johnson neighborhood planning process began in February 2000 and in July 2000, Austin LeBrock, director of the city of Austin PECSD, suspended the Go Valley Johnson neighborhood plan due to city staff unwilling, unwillingness to listen to neighborhood groups. For that, a neighborhood association forced a revision of neighborhood planning process and a new structure was implemented in 2001 with the Go Valley Johnson plan. Next slide. For well, that, a neighborhood association's revisions included the following. Fewer meetings with staff doing preparatory work so that neighborhoods would not be starting from scratch. Go Valley plan should include the Johnson Terrace neighborhood and the Austin Sector 8 plan should be used as a basis for new planning in the area. For well, this organizing in the community made the Go Valley Johnson Terrace planning process one of the strongest in the city. 22 meetings were held with an average attendance of 26 people at each meeting. And in addition, workshops were conducted with an average attendance of 40 people at each workshop. Hundreds of people participated in the development of the Go Valley Johnston uh, plan. Thank you, Susana, for giving this introduction. And now I'm going to ask Daniel some questions um, to get into more detail. So Daniel, you played a huge role in this whole process. Why don't you first start by introducing yourself and how you got involved with this? You're still on mute. I'll put the slides down too. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> I'm Dan Daniel Yanis, and uh, I moved into Go Valley Johnson Terrace in probably, uh, oh, 97. And uh, about a week later, I saw Susana at the HEB and she said, and I told her I'd moved into the neighborhood. And she said, where's your neighborhood association? <laughs> and uh, and uh, it was River Bluff, which was kind of dormant. And so Poder helped us to reignite it. And that's how I got here. Um, but but uh, before I go on, I'd like to um, acknowledge and give honor to the elders who were part of this planning process who are no longer with us. And they are Johnny Limon, who uh, recently passed away. And as a matter of fact, his nephew, Lani Limon, is now in his stead on the contact team. And also um, uh, uh, Miss Samaripa, who was from Brook neighborhood. Uh, she was one of the elders. And then of course, uh, Mr. Jorge Guerra, and uh, um, I get emotional because they were uh, lions and protectors of this neighborhood long before I came. Anyway, and so- don't, we'll be... And don't forget, uh, Daniel, don't forget uh, Mr. Tommy Williams. Yes, and Mr. Williams, uh, Bertha Williams' husband. Uh, um, those are the, uh, I would consider our elders who have you know since passed, but um, I, I, I've been blessed and honored to have known them and to continue the work that them and Susana and Sylvia and, and Janie and all the families from East Austin, from Go Valley. Uh, I appreciate that. So I forget what your question was. <laughs> um, how did you get involved specific, specifically in the Go Valley Johnson um, planning process? Oh, well, um, uh, uh, you know, in, in the late nineties, uh, we had the Tomorrow Plan, which um, in the mid eighties, in, in, uh, um, there was the tomorrow plan, which was not adopted as a comprehensive plan, but during that exercise over 200 neighborhood association, individual plans were adopted and became part of the code. So when I came to go Valley, uh, Johnson Terrace, same thing. There were, uh, uh, Sylvia, correct me if I'm wrong. I think there were nine neighborhood association plans that had been done in the eighties. So um, 
uh, so I was already in the neighborhood and then, and then this new planning process came up that combined uh, neighborhood associations and the city wanted to just eliminate all those plans and start over. And so uh, because I was working with Poder and, and with other neighborhood uh, uh, organizing, um, I got involved in the process at the very beginning. And um, um, I guess I was elected chair. They asked me to be chair and I've been chair ever since. <laughs> And can you tell us a little more about some of the challenges you faced um, with um, negative reception from the city and then also about the MOU? Yeah, actually, uh, you know, um, this process brought to light actually a cultural class between what I will call red path people and the white way and, and the, the establishment way of doing things, a pyramidal way of, of you know, majority rule and 51% rule versus the red pathway, which is a circle and everyone is equal and we work by consensus. So when we started this process, the, the very first thing, like I say, the city wanted to eliminate the neighborhood plans and the, the group, the stakeholder group refused to do that. And um, so in this, in this paradigm shift from a pyramidal structure to a circular structure of decision-making, uh, we, uh, we met with a lot of resistance. And um, so we were forced to vote and actually our contact team has voted three times and two votes happened the very first time. Uh, uh, one was city staff did not want Poder to be part of the process. But um, uh, so when we put it to a vote, they were outvoted and put it. <laughs> and then our second vote was to uh, uh, work by consensus and to vote only if there was a deadlock. And since the adoption of our plan up to now, we have only had one case where we didn't have deadlock, but there was, you know, uh, we didn't have total consensus. But in the end, that person acquiesced to the group and um, we work that way because if you have 49% of the people unhappy about a decision, it's very difficult to go, to go forward. And so in the circle, we discussed things and we worked it out to where um, we had consensus. And that's how we've, we probably have, uh, I will dare say we have the best track record of negotiations in the entire city. Uh, out of almost 40, uh, negotiations, probably about 35 of those have been win-win uh, situations that we've been able to negotiate through the consensus process with developers. But when you talk about the MOU, when we started, uh, you know, we're all volunteers and we all put in our time and our energy and the city didn't really uh, take that into account. And Mr. LeBrock um, uh, it wanted us to sign this MOU which gave all these responsibilities to us as the participants, but gave no responsibility for the implementation of our product. And so uh, we had a, um, you know, not a legal fight, but, but we wound up having an impasse. And Mr. LeBrock actually, um, I mentioned Mr. Guerra. I remember a, a, a meeting we had with Mr. LeBrock and he was just totally ugly and terrible to Mr. Guerra. And I, um, uh, so then we wound up filing ethics and racism complaints against Mr. LeBrock and his second in command. And the city, because he withdrew staff support because we wouldn't rubber stamp what, what, this, what they wanted we actually wanted to uh, create our own destiny. So there was a, what, a seven or nine month impasse, Susanna? Yes. Uh, uh -huh, uh, quite a long time. And then finally, Mr. LeBrock and his second in command were removed as the director of the planning process and someone else took his place. Uh, we were given what, we, what I call friendly staff. And then we continued for the next year and a half to actually craft and create what is now the, uh, um, the Go Valley Johnson Terrace neighborhood plan. And I will say that at, we were the third ones in the process. So city staff was creating stakeholder meetings, creating the, the plans, and then disbanding the groups. 
Well, when we completed our plan, the city staff wanted to disband us and we refused because we wanted to make sure that that, that plan is implemented. So we went to formally to the city council and the city uh, the planning uh, commission and informed them that we were going to stay in place and we were calling ourselves the review committee and that we wanted to be apprised of any zoning changes and we wanted to, to chime in. And um, amazingly, they said, okay. <laughs> and then there were about three or four years of this whole idea of these planning teams, stockholder, uh, uh, stakeholder meetings. And there were various ways that they were, uh, there was no regulation of it. So at one point, a few years into it, the city asked uh, the contact teams to create bylaws. So that's all they said. So we created our own bylaws that reflected the, the consensus policy uh, decision-making that I described earlier. And um, uh, uh, we got pushback from the city and we actually had to, had to uh, engage an attorney who was very skillful uh, in helping us craft our bylaws so that they would satisfy the city's uh, criteria, but allow us to continue to, to, um, to work uh, in consensus. And um, uh, so uh, at one point, the city author, uh, actually authorized the contact teams to be the official voice of the neighborhoods. And so that's how we are now. And, and still our contact team, the Go Valley Johnson Terrace contact team is made of uh, seven neighborhood association presidents, actually eight now, three nonprofits, including Poder and two businesses. Uh, and those are, are people who are from this neighborhood. Um, there's one uh, neighborhood association, Go Valley neighbors who are a, a lot of the newer people in the neighborhood and they um, have become part of our, uh, of our contact team. So those were the, you know, it was difficult because like I say, culturally, we, uh, the way that we make decisions and the way we perceive things is very different than the city. Uh, we think in terms of culture and families and what our neighborhoods are actually livable like, whereas the city thinks only of tax base and uh, statistics and, uh, and of course, is very pro-development, huge pro-development. So I'll, I'll be quiet and let other people talk. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing that. And then next, we're going to turn it over to Sylvia. I'm going to pull up the PowerPoint again. And Sylvia, could you tell us a little more about the demographics, who was living in this neighborhood, and why it was so crucial for the people living there to be a part of this neighborhood plan? You're on mute. Okay, thank you, Alexia, and thank you everyone uh, for uh, participating in this discussion. Um, I, I do want to recognize those elders and uh, those ancestors that have guided us in, in this path uh, for justice for our community. And uh, as uh, Danielle explained, the city you know, came in with, uh, with that attitude that they were gonna do things their way, but we had already been organizing and a reflective in the model that we use is working in uh, intergenerational and uh, working in uh, families. And so the first slide uh, sort of uh, captures that in that um, it's uh, the, the culture was there of, of family and it's reflected in our in our uh, ethnicity and in our background. Uh, the uh, statistics uh, demographics for the area of Go Valley Johnston Terrace uh, was um, termed Hispanic population was 81%, almost 82% of uh, of the group uh, in in the in the area. That's compared to the city uh, core, uh, and the average was uh, 38.5%. And uh, that was uh, our group, the uh, Go Valley Johnston Terrace was the only group 
that had above the Austin uh, average. Uh, and contrast, the Johnston Terrace was, uh, the white population was only 7.1 uh, compared to 43% for the city core. And so um, our community uh, was, um, can you go to the next slide? And we'll talk about the age, uh, which is uh, reflective of the work that we were doing. Uh, and we had in our uh, Go Valley Johnston Terrace area, we, we had the younger population from zero to 17 uh, that was, um, and as well as the older population from 45 uh, to 85 plus, those two groups were, had the higher proportion in our area. And, and that was totally different in other areas. And so, um, that uh, also reflects the intergenerational and the family connections that we had. These were families that had been living in the area for generations and uh, they were long-term residents that were in the area. So uh, there wasn't much fluctuation of, of families uh, coming and leaving uh, and uh, it was a very stable environment. Sylvia, will you go back to that, uh, the previous slide? Yes, the uh, first okay. one. Uh, would, oh. would you mention the Black population? Oh, yes. Uh, yeah, I, I um, also wanted to um, show that uh, the Black population at the time was 12.4 and uh, and 40, uh, let me see. Yeah, and no. those were the, those were the two uh, groups that were uh, represented in the area. Uh, the other groups were um, not not uh, very. Um, those those were the percentages that were above everybody else. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, the next uh, slide that we wanted to show and and uh, talk about is the uh, owner renter and uh, Go Valley Johnston uh, area had uh, the owner occupied uh, was 63%. Again, that was very, very high, the ownership in the area. And that was uh, the opposite of what the city uh, wide trends were. Uh, in fact, the, uh, the um, owner occupied uh, housing was 33 for the city. And the renter in, uh, in the Go Valley Johnston was 37. And the, uh, for the city, it was 67. So it was om almost a, a, a flip in the differences. Uh, and so again, this, uh, this shows very clearly that the Go Valley Johnston Terrace area was uh, made of uh, families and it was a very stable community where you had uh, homeowners that uh, you know, placed a, a value and importance of community. Uh, it was very community oriented uh, with uh, neighbors and, and families uh, sharing the space. Okay, the next slide, please. Okay, uh, this, uh, we talk about income, because this is also something that uh, is important to uh, describe the neighborhood. Uh, and uh, this slide shows the, the increases between uh, the uh, household incomes between 1990 which was 22,057. And by 2000, it was 30,440. So you see the increases already starting to happen. And um, <clears throat> we're working on other reports that uh, will you know, definitely identify that the, the medium or the household uh, incomes have really skyrocketed in the Go Valley Johnston area. The same with the family income. 
1990, it was 23,277. And by 2000, it was 35,147. So again, you see it starting to uh, change. The, uh, the other thing that's very important in the neighborhood planning uh, process in the area to describe the area was uh, what the actual use of the, of the properties were of, uh, in the Go Valley Johnston Terrace uh, area. And what you see is that um, you had single family and uh, you had the multifamily, which was at uh, you know, 19 for single family and 0.3% for multifamily. But then you have industrial and you have um, the um, a commercial that also are, you know, 18% for industrial, the 4% for commercial. But uh, what we want to show here uh, in the next slide has to do with land use and the actual zoning, because uh, these come into play in terms of the industries that were in, uh, in that particular area. And so the industrial and the commercial, we're talking about, uh, you know, the tank farm, for instance, was uh, uh, one of the industries. We had polluting industries throughout the area. And, um, and, and so alongside with single family uh, properties. So the next slide. Uh, talks about or shows the zoning. And uh, in this slide, you see that there were the zoning was single family was 39%, industrial was 26%, along with commercial at 5%. And um, in this particular slide, we have to um, identify the fact that in our area, in our neighborhoods, some of the single family properties were actually zoned industrial. And so uh, we found out that families, you know, had their homes uh, on property that was zoned industrial. And so when they would try to remodel or take out a loan, uh, they were told that they couldn't because their property was zoned industrial and they couldn't go out for a home improvement loan. And so there was a lot of, um, a lot of different uh, scenarios that came into play. And uh, it was uh, the industrial and the commercial properties, the amount of uh, of properties that were had that particular zoning that was actually killing uh, our community. And so that's why uh, BFI, that's why uh, the tank farm, that's why a lot of the polluting uh, uh, industries were in our area because we had that zoning at, sitting next to uh, industrial or even in, within the community, within the neighborhood, we had uh, industrial designated zoning. So um, that's just to describe the neighborhood. Um, and uh, I wanna mention a little bit about the tank farm and the discussions with the city. Uh, I mentioned that the tank farm uh, was uh, considered industrial, but at the same time, when we initiated our, the plan, the city didn't want or didn't include the tank farm. If you look at the boundaries, it does not include the tank farm area, which was 52 acres. And, uh, and also they did not wanna include the Johnson Terrace neighborhood, but uh, we fought because we had been already uh, organizing and they were being uh, affected by these industries and we felt that they were part of our neighborhood and needed to be part of the plan. So the city said, okay, we'll put Johnson Terrace in, but we're not putting the tank farm in. 
but the 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 strength of the group uh, that we had uh, put a tank farm uh, land use plan anyway into our neighborhood plan, which is very important uh, to point out. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and then now, Janie, could you tell us a little bit more first um, about your role in this whole process and explain some of the experiences you have, see um, you have seen from living in the area and how this plan was um, crucial in creating change in your community? And you're also on mute, sorry. <laughs> well, um, I can give you quite a story about this neighborhood and the neighborhood across the street. I've lived it. I have lived it. And when I joined up with Poder, I mean, they come aboard and stuff and we were all, we all got together like a big family. And when you have a big family, you're just a problem. You're all gonna get together and fight it. And that's exactly what Poder did. We went and we fought for what we have now. And you know, there's still a lot of work left. Um, for instance, when Billy and I moved out, they were, you know, sending out all these flowers and everything through the mail. Oh, y'all gonna be happy. You know, we're gonna recycle all this and all that, you know. But what they didn't really tell you was that the recycling was supposed to be across the, the street from where I live. And there's a big fence there, but they didn't have anything on top, a screen or nothing to hold the, the paper down. You get up in the morning, you have paper all over your trees, in your yard, in front of your windshields, you know. I mean, it was terrible. It was really very terrible. And we kept telling them, you know, like, y'all need to put something out. They said, well, we can't afford it right now. Wait, well, call the city. All the money that you're making by recycling and you tell me you don't have any money. They did have it, but they didn't care. They didn't care why, because why us, a small person going out there to want all this stuff, you know, that was not supposed to be done. They run the show, not us. Well, we got in the picture. We got in there and we started working with them. So, and and uh, like I said, it was like, it was trash everywhere. I picked up a bag one day because that's, that's how much garbage would come to my yard. I took a, a trash bag. I filled it up and I walked across the street because I'm right across the street from it. And I put it in front of their, their door. Well, Linda, the director, manager, whatever out there, she says, hey, uh, Janie, what are you doing? I said, I'm bringing your trash back. That's not mm -hmm. my trash, that's your trash now. I said, well, you have to take that back home. You know, the recycled truck. I said, y'all don't even have recycled trucks right now. I said, that trash is piling up. I said, you have to, that's your, your trash and I'm gonna leave it there. And she goes, well, why? I said, why? Because my dad always told me, if you see something and you, it's not yours, take it back to, to wherever, it, wherever it belongs to. So I took mm -hmm. it to y'all, yeah, that's your trash, not mine. And they were upset, but it stopped right there. After that, they started bringing, you know, they bring, you know, people out, you know, one of their, their employees would come in the neighborhood and pick up all the trash for us and stuff, you know. And one day they, they had this, this other man out there and he says, you know, you're giving us a lot of problems. I said, no, you're giving all of East Austin, my neighborhood, you've given us the problem. I said, I don't appreciate it. We're, we're not going to let you get away with this. We will fight back. He goes, well, we don't want y'all fighting us, then we will fight back. And he walked away. Well, okay, okay, we'll do what you got to do. So we did. Well, then took it, to, <laughs> took it to city council and everything. And we told him this, what we need for them to do there. Well, Gus Garcia, the former Gus Garcia, you know, he's passed on now. But at the time, we, so Sana and I took those, those recycled buckets. We each took a bucket and we put it right there where, where the, where the, pre, where the, the uh, mayor was sitting at. And he says, what is this? He started laughing, what is this? I said, I'm not gonna recycle anymore until that recycling goes into the company out across the street from my house and does not come back out. I'm not gonna be picking up everybody's, everybody's trash from other neighborhood, from other neighborhoods. So he started laughing, no, you can't do it. I said, yes, I can, so I was, we just did. And we told them we weren't gonna recycle nothing until they picked up. So eventually they did, you know, they, they had some new laws there that they had to do this or that, you know, pick up all the garbage and bring it back out there. And, uh, but like I said, we had to fight for it because we were, we were living in a poor neighborhood over here, Latinos, you know, African-Americans, they didn't care about us. They were all white people out there, you know, the people inside were all white, the people outside were Mexicanos, you know, and like I said, African-Americans, they were the ones doing all the dirty work, you know, and even now they didn't, they didn't say, well, you know, maybe, maybe would you like to come work with us or no? All they, all they cared about was pick up the trash and bring it up here and stuff now, you know. So I did. I kept doing it. And eventually, they, they didn't even have any smoke. All the paper, you would think that they would have, and their employees would go out and smoke. You would think, you would think that they had a smoke alarm or something. Well, that did not, all, this, all the cigarettes, they finally, the fire was started out there. 
They started a fire. Somebody was smoking there. And all I could say was, it must have been somebody smoking there. Somebody threw it through it. Just, you know, one of your employees probably threw it out of yourself. You could have been throwing it out there. Well, it burned most of the, most of the, everything that was up there. I mean, it was a big, I think it was like a five alarm fire. And it even burned some of the trees across the street from where the, from the BFI is. But had, for them not, not come in and done the work that they did, you know, myself included, you know, I was right there, you know, and I mean, it, it would have probably still been there, but they worked. And for them, might be a small group and, you know, there it's like a family, you know, when something happens to one of us, we're going to go help. We're going to be there, you know, and that's what for that does, you know. We're helping everybody that we can help. Another thing, and this, but this is because we're we're a poor neighborhood. And we weren't, we were like, you know, these other, you know, rich people, you know, wealthy people. They wouldn't be throwing no garbage. They didn't garbage fall out there, you know, in your yard, you know. Same thing with uh, my backyard. There was a uh, in back of my house, back of my yard. There was a, a transmission uh, company there, and they did radiators. They did all kind of stuff. But all all the stuff they took out of there, all the the poisonous, all the lead was going down in back of my house and then on the bottom of the fence it would seep into the ground at the time my grandson was like two years old and he was out there and uh he would be playing with his little chunk of trucks so my husband used to work for the city driving his big trucks so he bought him a set of trucks too he would be out there but he would be playing he was only two years old you know you go out there you know little kids are gonna pick up their mind clean all their sweat off their face and stuff well every day that's what happened to him well, he started getting real sick, started getting, you know, you know aches. And, you know, except my grandma, my, my, my stomach hurts, my stomach hurts. Then he started getting temperatures and stuff. You name it, he had it. So we took him to the doctor. And the doctor said, we're going to have to run some tests on him. I said, fine, you know, we need to find out what's wrong with him. Well, kind of found out a couple of days later, they said he had, he had, uh, he had just adjusted some, some, uh, uh, some lead. He said, and that, I said, can really ruin the child's life, you know? I mean, that, that is, is it's, uh, it's like a poison to them, you know? So he says, I'm gonna send a, I'm gonna send someone out there to go check out there. They send this little skinny white man up to, to, over here to the house. He goes, well, I don't see nothing. I said, well, you have to go in the backyard. Go out there. I'm gonna give you a spoon. You go eat some of that dirt. See, I see what happens to you. He goes, oh no, no. He says, well, he just all he did when it was a court enforcement. We're not across. The, he just looked up across the fence. I don't see nothing. I said, well, go around the backyard so you'll see it. I said, but it was like a spongy white, you know, the thing that was there. But he said, oh, no, that's probably just from whatever they thought. So well, they, they've been throwing all that, all that, all that the, all the things that they use in there, you know, chemicals, you know, that's all it is. Anyway, so we took, we took uh, Jonathan back and he graduated from high school. You know, he's very well educated. He's very smart and stuff, you know, but he could have come out, you know, like they could have said, you know, that he would have been real slow, you know, and just, you know, had so many problems throughout his lifetime. But thank God that we got him help when, when, we, when we found out what was going on. And otherwise, like I said, you know, he wouldn't have been able to do nothing nowadays, you know. But like I said, if, if we had if we hadn't just left it alone, they wouldn't have done it. But because it was on the east side, they didn't care. The city didn't care about sending somebody out there. You send out, you, you call for the court enforcer. He's supposed to go inspect. This one just peeped over the fence. He's done. He's gone for the day. You know, that's not right. Because if it had been a white person, they'd have been out there. They probably had a lawsuit on the oh, the whole city. Anyway, so uh, they, since then, the city, after all this happened. The city goes out there and then they, they have to send all, you know, as many people they could to the east side. They wanted people with older houses and stuff, you know, and past 70s and stuff to have their windows, you know, uh, fixed again. You know, they had to scrape all that glue and all that stuff, you know, because that was going to be lit too. And that's why the parks and Go Valley was one of the first parks that they cleaned up. Because the kids, you know, you go out there, you hold on, you know, to the swings and stuff. Well, that, the park was full of lead also. And then that's how lead started to come around, you know, in East Austin. And now everybody, you know, you go out to the city and, you know, they, they check, you know, routinely, you know, to see what's on, you know, what's on the equipment and stuff, you know, and that really, that really helps, you know. And like I said, you know, they just didn't care about the East side. They're going to fix everything else except the East side. And like I said, again, for that was right there, you know, and, you know, so I'm proud to be part of for that. I mean, like, you know, I mean, even though like, you know, I can't do as much <laughs> anymore, but you know, I mean, they've done a lot, you know, and I'm proud of for that. I'm proud to be a member of for that. And then too, on the tank farm, the tank farm is right across the street, right across even where, where I live. And every time they had, my, my daughter was about seven or eight at the time. She would hear a siren. She, Grandma, cause, you know, I guess she heard me all the time talking and for that, you know, about, you know, how it's going to blow up one day that, you know, they can they happen this, that and stuff, you know, and I mean, she didn't understand she was a child. And she would, she would get her little chair, little, a little black backpack, and she would pick it up, and she'd put our little clothes in there. And she said, Grandma, I already, I'm already ready in case we have to leave. But she didn't, <laughs> what she didn't realize was if that, if that tank farm had blown up, we wouldn't have had a chance to move out. We, wouldn't have, we would have been here, probably gotten blown up too, you know. So 
kind of, you know, just say, okay, we'll have it ready, you know. And she did that until she was about 10 years old. She learned, you know, the real truth, you know. <coughs> Excuse me. And then she learned, you know, the real truth. And I had to sit her down and tell her, you know, so she would know. So then after that, she would go to school and she would tell her teacher about it. They had a class one year. And she, you know, it was a PTA and, you know, all the students had to come up with something. Well, she came out talking about the tank farm. And everybody, they would say, oh, I'm so proud of you. I mean, what child at that age is going to know anything about what's going on across the street? You know, not, not ever being out there, you know. And so, well, because my mama and Susana, they always talk about it and they tell us about it. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> she learned from that, you know. And then, so they, they had started having, her teacher started having a little class about all the environment, you know, problems in on the east side. But like I said, we have done a lot, you know, for that has done so much. Susanna has gone out of her way to make sure that everybody is taken care of, you know. And I really appreciate that, you know. And it's yeah. like, it's wonderful, you know. So thank you, Susanna. We're still here. We still live in the same house, you know. We're not going <laughs> well, I don't know, but they, there was a house across the street that, that was, that was uh, bought for $1 million on the corner, right here on my street mm -hmm. on Galicia. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Janie, we, we want to thank you so much for bringing it because I think Janie brings a really good point uh, to the conversation uh, because um, it, it all had to do with zoning, right? And that's what our topic is today is zoning. Uh, so uh, here was Janie in the Gardens neighborhood uh, area with all residential yet living next to a mini landfill because people who don't know BFI was a, is the second largest um, recycling facility in the whole world, really. But uh, it was a city of Austin who who contracted BFI and was bringing 300 over 350,000 recyclables to East Austin. And so when you bring over these recyclables, you also were bringing the industrial traffic. So the industrial traffic was coming up and down Bon Road because they had to empty those big trucks with the recyclables. And if people are not aware of uh, the recyclables, um, uh, they have an odor. I mean, when you have beer bottles, empty milk uh, cartons, wet newspaper, it attracted rodents and insects. So this is what happened when you have industrial zoning in a residential area. You heard Sylvia said, when you look at these maps, it's really telling because it told what was actually there and what the zoning was, right? So you had a lot of the home zone industrial. And that goes back to the city's racist land use policies when it did a, a, um, a cumulative zoning. And so what it did was it blanket zone East Austin Industrial and it made it possible for residential and all types of zoning to fit under industrial, whereas in West Austin, you did not have cumulative zoning. You had single family, so you couldn't bring in an industrial zoning into that particular area. Uh, and so when you talk about the tank farm, uh, so we talked about the tank farm was a, a, storage, a storage facility where gas was stored, gasoline by products was stored. And you had six large uh, tank art, uh, corporations, some of the largest corporations in the world, Exxon, Chevron, Citco, Gulf, uh, Coastal States, and uh, Mobile, all were there in that 52 uh, acres. And so here was a community that was allowed to have all of this polluting and industrial facilities. And I may add that this was not just happening in East Austin. It was happening in communities of color throughout the United States. If we look at, this was the same pattern. It was either your, the people of color communities were divided by the highway or the railroad tracks. You know, that's how you signified what part of the town you were. And you were usually downstream from where the water ran because they looked at topography in, on, their, on their racist uh, land use policies. And so, um, so we, we could see, you know, Janie's testimony of living in kind of this toxic donut being surrounded by all these industrial facilities where when the city did a plan, it came out that 90%, 94% of all the industrial zoning was in East Austin. So it, it, it documented that we were we were the site where all the unwanted waste, hazards, polluting facilities were in East Austin. As a matter of fact, well, that took that on. Uh, we were the first and only environmental justice group in Austin and the group that was made of people of color. 
and we defined what uh, what the environment was because mainstream environmentalists had defined the environment as only nature. And Poder came in and redefined the environment as not only nature, but nature and human, and that they were interwoven, interlocked, and inseparable, and you had to address uh, the same things. And so, so we saw the height of the environmental racism uh, movement in the late 1997s, of, and people were becoming more aware of how all the polluting facilities were in communities of color or in low-income communities. And for well, that had to address the root cause and the root cause was zoning. Zoning policies that have been instituted since the 1928 master plan and how that plan would begin the, uh, the segregation of Austin between East and West and how Highway 35 at that time would become uh, sort of like the border wall, the physical wall would be Highway 35 and all the unwanted things would be put in East Austin and that included people of color, right? And so uh, for us to continue to, walk, to work on this was a very big issue, uh, but like, like everyone has said, we were family-based organizing and so it wasn't just organizing individuals, we're organizing families and you heard Jamie talk about her grandson, her daughter, so all of us talking about the family base of how we all came together uh, to address these issues. And I do want to say that at the time when there was a split, when Daniel talks about Austin LeBrock uh, trying to put a halt to the neighborhood planning process in Go Valley Johnston, because we were so organizing and insisting that the Johnson Terrace come along with uh, the Go Valley area and that the tank farm be involved and that for oh, also have a, a seat at the table because we had already been organizing and helping to establish neighborhood associations. And that was a real power of having neighborhood associations. And I say that seven neighborhood associations belong to Poder. And so we were there all at the table and then to try to, like you said, disband the neighborhood groups, that wasn't gonna happen. <laughs> or to try to say, if you look, lived in the Brook neighborhood, you can't speak for someone who lived in the Johnson neighborhood. You know, this divide and conquer thing uh, wasn't going to hold it. And that was one of the big fight that we had with the initial city staff. And then when they regroup and, and, they ha and it took a process, that meant us going, like Daniel said, to the Ethics Commission filing complaints. I mean, us going to the Planning Commission. We went to all boards and commissions to talk about this process and how uh, staff was trying to hinder what community really wanted and desired, right? And, and it wasn't until new young staff came aboard and I want to, uh, to recognize that because we then had um, Steve Rossiter, Ricardo Solis, uh, Brian Block, and also Anique Baudet, they were all part, they were all very young uh, planners working for the city and had more of a grasp and an understanding of the community, as a matter of fact, they made sure that they looked at property by property and actually see what the use was. Because in order to know what the use was, then you could change the zoning. And that's why I think that us working with young minds and people who were open to and recognize the racism and the legacy of racism in the city of Austin and recognize that that needed to change and we're willing to work with the community to change a lot of the zoning that was incompatible, incompatible zoning. So, you know, that, I think that that's how it led us to making this historic history of rezoning over 600 properties that had never been done before and no lawsuits were filed <laughs> uh, like in Code Next. Th this was something that we knew that was happening and that we also had to talk to the city council members uh, at that time, you know, um, Des Garcia was on the council and did have a lot of understanding of what was happening uh, in the community. And so that was really helpful uh, in getting this uh, passed forward. But I think that that was, um, you know, all the decades of working together, right? And that zoning just didn't happen. Uh, we had already taken part in the Sister Chavez plan and we had, saw, we had seen how the city had blanket zoned that community. And we saw 
what was going to happen to that community. As a matter of fact, all the points that we brought up about that community um, being, you know, the people not being able to live there, gentrification, because they were some commercial mixed use, they wouldn't qualify for equity home loans, all of these things that we said would happen if that plan went forward. And even though we did a valid petition, unfortunately, we didn't have a lawyer at that time uh, and they threw out our valid petition. Uh, but uh, actually everything we said came you know, to realization and, and that area is completely gentrified. If you look in UT's uprooted report that was commissioned by the city of Austin, it shows that Cesar Chavez is gone. The barrio there is gone. Holly is also gone. You know, there's still a few people in all these neighborhoods, but basically they've all been gentrified. Go Valley and Johnson is on his way there. And that the last community uh, that could really be saved if the city was really serious, it would be the Montopolis uh, community. Uh, and so again, it all has to do with zoning and how um, the city has used zoning to displace and to gentrify our communities. First is to poison us with all this industrial hazardous facilities. And once we clean it up, here's the backlash is that now you're going to lose your land and we're going to come in and take over the land. So it's really a land struggle for us. It's a land struggle. It's how do we keep a hold of our land? Uh, like Alexis said at the beginning, you know, it's stolen land. It belongs to a lot of the indigenous people and how we've had to come back and buy that piece of land. And now we're in jeopardy of losing that piece of land uh, that's so sacred to us. Uh, and so uh, those are the parts that I wanted to add, you know, to this uh, discussion. Susanna, can I, can I add to that, if I may, about... Sure. Well, the cultural thing, you know, um, uh, uh, Mexican Americans, Chicanos, you know, we are indigenous. We are Red Path, uh, and we, we as you know, as a as a group, have been assimilated for long, uh, isolated at the same time. That um, this is why I mentioned at the very beginning about a culture clash. Uh, uh, not only of organizing, but, um, you know, what Janie described with, with the uh, uh, BFI is, illustrates the, 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 the uh, attitude, the culture of systemic racism, where Janie said, you know, uh, the, the white world did, doesn't care about black and brown people. We see that evidenced with, with the whole Black Lives Matter thing. But I just want to uh, stress and let people know that we are Red Path people, and we are still here. <laughs> yeah. That's all. I wanted to just uh, bring up a little something because what what we're talking about we're land based and and uh, and we've gone through the process and it's it's a reminder of the constant relocation of our peoples and mm -hmm. also that the treaties that have not been honored, just like our neighborhood plans have not been honored and respected uh, as to what the voice of the community has said, it's written down, not only were we in discussions, but we actually took the time to uh, create these documents and the, yet the city uh, has not, uh, 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 complied with the request of the community. And one of those, uh, I reviewed the, the plan again, because there's so much to it. One of the things that the community had said was that we didn't want any more commercial service uh, for, uh, for alcohol. And uh, because we know that the uh, cigarettes and, and liquor uh, was something that was targeted into our community. And yet, you know, that has not been respected. Uh, and, you know, we had, you know, children, we have families that we wanted to, to protect. And, and yet uh, that has totally changed. I also wanted to recognize uh, uh, someone else that was very instrumental in, in this, um, in this struggle and participated 
uh, was uh, Chris Spaniel. He was yes. uh, uh, a co-chair of the tank farm, but he was also the representative from the Johnston uh, Terrace community. And um, I also wanted to recognize him as someone that uh, was there uh, with us and is no longer uh, here with us. Yeah, and thank you, Sylvia, because that also leads to remind me for Mr. Paul Sacedo. Uh, Mr. Paul Sacedo was another person who was another elder, very much involved, you know, in, in the whole, uh, with the tank farm, but also uh, attended the meetings. Uh, and uh, Dr. Frederick Otto, who was also uh, very much instrumental uh, with us and, uh, and Felipe Gutierrez, who was the one who sounded the alarm with that the uh, the petroleum byproducts were not just at the tank farm, that they had traveled offsite, uh, and his home was actually there adjacent to the Go Valley Park in the Go Valley Johnston uh, planning area. And you're right, it was very hard for the city not to uh, talk about the tank farm when we talked about Go Valley Johnston because residents live adjacent, like like Janie and then um, uh, Mr. Philip Gutierrez and other people, right, who live right across from the tank farm. So it was very much a real, even though um, they would not let us have that particular land in our neighborhood planning area. That didn't stop us from also uh, rezoning uh, the tank farm properties. Mm -hmm. And so that was one of the first things that we did was, in, and that was in 93, the next step was, let's rezone the tank farm from industrial to more compatible zoning so that we would never have another uh, industrial site. And the same thing for BFI, the, the next step was after we closed it in 95 was let's rezone the BFI uh, property so that we'll never have an industrial site come into a residential area. And so these are real important things of how we've been addressing the whole um, the zoning issues. And like you said, uh, I really liked about the broken treaties and comparing that to the adoption of our land use plans. Because even today, we're constantly having to fight the rezoning when we've adopted these plans. And as the city keeps talking about displacement and gentrification and building affordable housing, but it keeps uh, taking uh, a, a different action uh, is completely opposite of our neighborhood plans and completely opposite of the community that's been here uh, for generations also. Yeah, thank you for, for framing it that way, Sylvia, that really our neighborhood plan is like the treaties uh, and, and there's, they're constantly trying to amend them. Um, but, you know, in, in the last, what, four years, I think, the city finally uh, uh, officially recognized and, and acknowledged its uh, racist legacy. And, and, and we, Poder, and many of the people in, in, in our milieu work, have worked with others in the city to create the equity office and the equity tool. And we are also uh, being proactive in identifying uh, through zoning, identifying areas in our neighborhood where we can build affordable housing with a formula that has grown out of this neighborhood. Um, so uh, we're moving forward uh, as we go, but it's, it's a constant vigilance of, like you say, broken treaties. <laughs> it's interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and uh, in this whole uh, perspective and, and process, uh, one of the things that we uh, we heard in terms of property devaluations when we went through the tank farm devaluation of our properties, but then uh, now the you know the market has has gotten out of control, uh, and so it's been hard for us to maintain and keep our properties in East Austin. Uh, but um, at the time, there was a discussion of like, you should be happy your properties are valued so high, you know, and uh, because you can sell it, you know, and uh, it wasn't about selling. It was about for future generations, for our children, for our grandchildren to have something. 
And, uh, and then it wasn't about flipping properties. Uh, it, we have a different connection to, to what we have and, uh, and what we treasure. And so I, I think that, you know, it's a totally different mindset in how people view uh, their space and, and, and how we as residents of the Go Valley area really in, integrated those perspectives and that vision of what the community uh, wanted that area and that environment to be. Right. And, and I want to add, you know, when, uh, when those workshops where they said there was an average of at least 40 in each one of them, when we talked about the community values and characteristics, the number one value was uh, preservation of single family homes. That was, that was a number one value for the community. And I say, it's very telling when you gave the stats about families, right? And who's there uh, is, is for people and how you had 67% ownership. And we saw the same thing in the Holly and Cesar Chavez that most of those neighborhoods uh, before these plans were adopted they had a high ownership of 65, 67% ownership. They're down to 20% Latino you know, ownership. But in all these neighborhood plans, which were the barrios that we call, they were all at the high 60s ownerships and uh, where the rest of Austin was majority renters, right? And so, uh, but here in the Go Valley, Johnston, the people said um, preserving the single family home was the most important value Another value was expanding services for the elderly. Again, it's telling like who we really care about, right? We care about our elders. Our elders are very important for us. And we also mentioned uh, more opportunities for affordable home ownership. Even though we had 67%, we were already thinking about the next generation, right? We wanna make sure that we continue this ownership process. And we also talked about improving our quality of our local creeks, because people were very concerned about what had happened to Boggy Creek, but also about the continued erosion that was happening in Boggy Creek. And also to remember at that time, uh, Austin Community College was going to um, put the parking lot over part of that Boggy Creek that, uh -huh. that came to uh, ACC and the struggle that we had to take on in, in fighting that whole thing in, in Oak Springs. So again, um, here was a community that was very much uh, concerned about the environment and very much concerned about our local creeks and what was happening to our local creeks because everybody understood how part of Boggy Creek had been cemented for miles and what, and what um, how painful that was that our children would think that the Broggy Creek was just a cemented canal and would never be able to touch, touch the sand in that creek because it was all cemented, but also to take care of the creek that wasn't cemented uh, heading north, right? And so I think that these are real important, uh, you know, community values and, and characteristics uh, they were in our neighborhood plan, and they're very telling uh, to the profile that you talked about, uh, Sylvia, in, and who was really making up uh, the Go Valley area neighborhoods. And that's also a distinction, uh, you know, what you were, you were saying, like, what is important to people, you know, uh, our neighborhoods and our homes and our businesses are 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 the you know the infrastructure for our families they're not investments this is the thing that we deal with constantly in the zoning fight with developers or with people that come from other places and buy a property and then work to increase the value and then sell we 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 see that uh, so often and that is um, uh, I almost feel apologetic, but I, but really not about seeing this as the white path and the red path in that the white path, you know, came to uh, uh, Anahuac, to Turtle Island, to Atzlan here. And, um, 
and you know put up fences privatized everything and 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 the attitude is the land is investment and as opposed to a red path where we are part of the land we are like the leaves on the trees like the branches we are like the rocks the the creeks are the veins of our neighborhoods and um and that is also very telling is the the way that all of the creeks east of Ike's 35 have been treated very, very differently than the creek systems west of Ike's 35. And that actually came out in a report a few years ago. Uh, I can't mm -hmm. cite exactly which one it is, but I, I do remember them saying that that was part of systemic racism, which is what we are um, turning the tide on. At least, aquí estamos y no nos vamos. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, thank you for sharing all of that. Um, as we come to an end of the conversation, I kind of want to give everyone a time to think about any final thoughts they want to share on the legacy of um, the Go Valley and Johnson Terrace plan and what we need to do moving forward. And any of the panelists can answer that if you feel inclined to do that. <laughs> Well, going forward is like, uh, you know, we continue to stay unified. Uh, as a matter of fact, we continue to identify people and bring them into um, uh, help them organize into, into, into neighborhood associations. You know, I will say that uh, an organization like Poder or neighborhood associations, that's really the place where we have government of, by and for the people. Whereas the bureaucracy to me and the culture of government is actually has been hijacked by, um, by the 1%, you know, the globalists that have a franchise in every single city and Austin is no different. Um, we know that, that worldwide interests uh, are divvying up East Austin because there is a, a uh, like I say, a complicity by the establishment. And so, um, you know, we, we continue to, to work on that and to, to resist, really. So, you know, that's what I have to say as a closing thought. Uh, yeah, and I just want to add that um, as, you know, as, a, as new residents move into the community, I want them to be very conscious, conscious of the, the legacy that people of color and low income people have had to endure and to be very conscious about what is happening. And as they come in, um, they need to look at the history part and work with low income and communities of color and integrate themselves into the community, but have that understanding of where community is coming from and why it's important uh, when we talk about sustainability is how do we sustain a people who've been there for um, generations in place uh, and how do we make it so that um, people are not displaced and that we don't bring uh, harm with, uh, with solutions that we think will you know, better uh, other people. And so uh, just working together uh, to balance uh, nature and humanity, I think, uh, and, I, and I will close with this one indigenous saying, um, there was a time when we were all sisters and brothers. Oh. Uh, the night sky, our ceiling, the earth, our mother, the, the sun, our father, and our parents, our leaders, and justice, their guide. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Susanna, you always get me with that. Every time y'all do some grounding, I just want to cry because we don't hear enough of it. And I, I try to embed that in any space I hold. It's Thank always you. moving. Thank you for joining us, Cynthia. Yeah, I'm happy to be here. I learned a lot. I saw Erica Leek uh, um, in the chat, you know, say that she had to leave, but she was very appreciative. I'm very happy that she um, tuned in because she, you know, she's one of those bureaucrats and she's been in a lot of departments and she knows what's up these days. And she's in now in neighborhood housing. Um, mm -hmm. and, 
and so that's good. I, I don't know who the other who the gentleman was that was here, but uh, he also in the chat thanks and thanked us for this. Um, well, if anyone doesn't have any other thoughts, I will end the night. Um, thank you all for being here. Thank you all for coming. This video will be uploaded to our YouTube and you can just find that through our website and please share it with your friends and family to keep this history alive. And I don't know, Susanna, if you have any announcements um, for upcoming for that events. I, I think uh, Daniel will be doing block walking with uh, with oh. the, uh, uh, tomorrow, tomorrow on the Prop A, No Way okay. Prop A, tomorrow and Friday? Sunday. No, Friday. It's Friday. Friday and Sunday. Friday. 10 o'clock. Yeah, Friday, Friday and, and Sunday. Uh, and we're Sunday. Doing oh, excellent. And we will be coming, we will be having uh, a meeting with the uh, Colorado uh, River Conservancy uh, on November the 6th. And we'll be sending out an email and invite on, on that on that particular project too. I have a question. I know you're trying to close Alexia, my bad. No, keep going. Um, I'm interested in bringing this presentation about zoning into our, maybe our neighborhood contact team. I used to stay in O2, yeah. I've been gentrified yeah. out. Yeah, um, yeah. Our house was on um, oh, on Santa Rosa. And mm -hmm. We also have property on Hidalgo. Um, since I can't afford to move back into my neighborhood, there's a little conflict with our family properties. Mm -hmm. The most affordable house that I found was in the Go Valley area at $445,000 for a three bedroom. I'll never afford that. Oh, yeah. um, so right now in 4-4, density is like the hot the hot thing right and we have a high ho home owner rate here so i'm also trying to educate the people around me about how important it is to preserve preserve our sf1s our sf2s um mm -hmm. and it's hard it's a difficult conversation because the bike lanes that we got back in the east side maybe in between 2005 and 2010 it's right. horrible over here they're pushing all the same stuff that they pushed on us in the east side Mm -hmm. I got to start from scratch here, y'all. And I'm exhausted. Yeah. Like, I got to yeah. start from scratch addressing all these gentrification issues in 4-4. In yeah. Well, C Cynthia, this will be up on the website, and, and your your contact team can certainly pick a, a time to view this. All right. Uh, and, and um, you know, I speak for myself, but I, I, I imagine that, that uh, Susanna and maybe Sylvia, when she's in town, we'd be happy to... to help in any way we can All right. as time goes forward. Absolutely. I can send the presentation over the PowerPoint. So oh, I would appreciate that. Thanks, Alexia. Yeah. Thank you, Alexia. Thank you, Alexia. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Good night, everybody. Yes, when I'm not just. Bye. 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 Bye.